Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. Good morning. Our senior uh, youth minister, Jeremy Langell, and I have, over the past months, met with the four graduating seniors who will preach at the four different Eucharists at All Saints today. This year, we wanted our youth preachers both to grapple with the scripture texts appointed for the today as well as to engage one or more contemporary issues that the texts and their lives raised for consideration, as well as reveal something of who they are in the course of the sermon. Shorthand, I asked them to consider their sermon for you this morning to be a venture on this high dive, this pulpit, feels like a high dive sometimes, with that much exhilaration at stake. Another metaphor we used was for them to consider this their I have a dream speech, or the last sermon they would ever preach. (laughs) So these teenaged leaders are today going to open their hearts, minds, souls, thinking, feeling, and lives to you. They are conduits of the grace-filled, awesome Spirit of God that swirls, refreshes, and blows through this All Saints faith community every day. So lean in, pray, receive, Let yourself be touched and changed, and all the while, give thanks to God. It is my privilege at this nine o'clock sermon to introduce to you Tori Dutcher Brown, who will graduate next Sunday from Mayfield School. She will be going in September to Boston University to study molecular biology and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, the subjects that I majored in in college. (laughs) Will you warmly welcome Tori Dutcher Brown. The likelihood of anything hitting the exact coordinates of All Saints Church, 34.147 by negative 18.143, is infinitesimally small. Then, when you factor in the likelihood that an object would survive the passage through the atmosphere without completely breaking up, or that something even had the velocity out in the universe to hurtle towards 132 North Euclid Avenue, Pasadena, California, you could almost say the chances are in the red. But really, couldn't you say that this probability is the same as the chance that you will learn something new at a specific moment from a specific person with a specific intent? Isn't it the probability of discovery, the chance of progress? Ten years ago, I was a very different person. Some things have persisted, my love of dance, my tendency to break out into song, my knack for facts, and the truth that I still have two moms. Besides that, I have changed in almost every way, especially in my opinions about the very things that have remained constant. When I was younger, I thought the worst possible outcome of a doctor's visit was to have blood work ordered. I had heard from my classmates how scary it was to see blood pulled out of you how that one girl in my class, Stephanie, had almost fainted, 
They said that the tiny pinch the doctor promises really does not feel tiny or like a pinch at all. Having heard these horror stories, I truly worked myself up, crying and thrashing about the first time I had to face the procedure. When it happened, the anticlimactic experience only left me with a blotchy face and a good sense of embarrassment. That I had let my unfounded fears command my behavior to the extent that it changed how the adults around me perceived me, and they carried those incorrect notions long after the doctor's visit was over. I learned, and I began to observe and draw my own conclusions, so I did not fall victim again. Though I thought myself accomplished in this task of observing and drawing my own conclusions, there was still an area I was unconsciously was allowing fear to manipulate me. How I publicly acknowledged my family. The only time my mothers and I were not in the minority was for a week on the Our Family cruise designated for LGBT families. So for the other 883 weeks of my life, I've had to answer the question. What do you mean you don't have a dad? I let my fears dictate my actions, and I began to speak less and less about my family. Attending a Catholic high school, I barely spoke of my mother's at all. I guarded myself, only telling very few people directly. I used vague pronouns to describe my mother's, such as they, parents, or an interchangeable singular she. Despite this, I never hid my interests in social justice and LGBTQ issues. I organized a school-wide Purple Ribbon Day in my sophomore, junior, and senior years to honor the gay teen suicides of September 2010. I attempted to found a gay-straight alliance against tremendous opposition, and I found a way to raise consciousness by participating in the diversity committee. But on a personal level, I was still hiding. Throughout those years, I told myself that I was not lying about my family, that I was not being deceitful, that being at a Catholic school where I was the estab establishment's first gay family to attend, that I was just protecting my own interests. I got to a point where I realized I didn't need to act the coward. I could no longer hide myself. I could no longer risk the honor of my family and my cause. Clarifying who my parents are during a school-wide diversity committee assembly felt like a coming-out experience. For the first time ever, I had the classic symptoms: the rolling stomach, clammy hands, and short breath. Signs that this impacted me and made me so much more nervous than the numerous dance shows, choir concerts, and public narrations ever did. The experience, like the blood test. Turned out to be liberating for me, impactful in the assembly, and I had designed to display the different types of families and their true validity. Knowing the sting of shame firsthand, whether it be at the doctor's office or hiding having two moms, I meet today's lesson with anger and disbelief. How could Elijah, the hero of the chapter, call into question the legitimacy? Of the prophets of Baal's god, how could the loving God described in the Bible diminish the emotion and commitment the prophets gave to Baal, the very same emotions and commitments Elijah gives to his god? The prophets love Baal just as much as Elijah loves the Hebrew god, possibly even more. Who are we to say otherwise? I can feel it now, the molten feeling pitting in the center of my chest, ready to come out and destroy. So ready to defend and wound from habituation, I have once again let my judgment become clouded and blindly dictate my actions. Here I am, attempting to preach anger, the antithesis of what I believe should be done, and the opposite of what this community has shown me: the sanctity of love. When reflecting on this lesson with Ed and Jeremy. I was confused as to why I was becoming so frustrated, not realizing I had once again become victim to fear. The malignant phantom completely blocked me from realizing another purpose behind the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. 
that despite persecution and uncertainty, truth and love will be made known. When approaching any idea of God or creation, I tend to shy away from a figure or non-organic event model that is accepted by a majority of society. Instead, I identify with the notion that, in the beginning, there was an essence of truth. That truth being the space between people, the relationship. And now our present is that realization of that space, of that atomic interference we experience every moment. I find myself in alignment with the River Pomo tribe of Northern California, who believe the space between inhalation and exhalation to be sacred. It amazes me that this moment of seemingly nothingness really holds all the possible potential for life. I could put off my next breath, prolonging the resulting tightness and suspending myself in the moment. I could forgo a natural pace and hyperventilate, reducing my cognitive ability and neglecting my time and with the sacred space between. I almost let fear paralyze my enjoyment of the in-between space. But on Mount Carmel, Elijah did not succumb. Elijah the prophet came near, comma, and said, comma, Yahweh. In that phrase alone, it was necessary for the character Elijah to dip into that sacred in-between space three times, once at each comma, and thirdly at the word Yahweh, known to represent breath, a word so sacred it is seldom spoken in some traditions. After that revelation, I again naively thought I was done with this whole personal advancement thing. But then Tuesday night, Eve Ensler came down to the forum like the fire on Mount Carmel, burning out my insecurities brought on by shame, the same way she discussed how her chemotherapy had burned out the shame which had exiled her from her own body because of violence and abuse. Eve shared with the forum the truth that we do not need to brand everything we do. She reminded me that we are a single community, not divided by race, gender, sexuality, class, religion, citizenship, or cause. That we are conditioned to believe we are divided, just like I was conditioned to to fear my blood test. Because when we are pinned against one another, it is easier for public opinion to be dictated preserving one's group's so-called superiority. When we allow ourselves to be set against each other by tyranny, we are aiding in our own destruction. When we act on the societal pressure to claim a project as our own, no matter how good-intentioned, we are pulling away from the community and not achieving the love, change, and compassion we so desire. In this way, we can understand the Roman officer's true humanity in calling out to Jesus to heal his slave. When first listening to the narrative, the trait most commonly assigned to the officer is humility, the modest opinion of one's own rank. This definition fits the situation, but it maintains the knowledge that one still has a rank, that one is different than the other. In the Gospel, the officer truly embodies the message of Jesus by acting on the principle that he and the slave are of the same value and are not distinguishable in importance. The officer has let the flame of compassion burn away his conditioned shame, leaving that sacred space between him and the rest of humanity open. If I were to end here, I fear so would the message of truth which we together have discovered through community and the interpretation of today's lesson and gospel. Through my rejection of shame, I have found compassion to never be finite. There is always a greater reality of the open space in which love flows freely, hurtling down on Mount Carmel, insulating my mothers and I.
protecting the Roman officer's slave between the inhale and the exhale, and maintaining the universal oneness of everything, of this, and maintaining the potential for the world to be so thick with it that I can feel the energy as I reach out and curl my fingers around it. I want it to be so fluid, so that all can easily access the power, so that all are recognized as worthy of the power, so that all are guaranteed the right to love and be loved. So find it within you, that compassion, that joy, and maybe let it burn through our drenched and gravid shame. Let us go out into the in-between space and nourish the world. Amen.